Welcome. I'm Judy Clem with the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, and I'm joined tonight by um, several board members, but my partner in crime is Kayla Chase. She's our membership chair at the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. And um, so we're just happy to see you all and have you here as part of our winter lecture series. We have another um, program coming up that might have a few more spots in it. It's on winter pruning. And um, that is uh, coming up the last week of February. So check that out on our website. Um, so let me just take a step back and ask you if you knew, did you know the Oak Park Conservatory began as a community effort to provide a place to house exotic plants that residents collected during their travels abroad? It was completed in 1929 and it's now listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. The Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory formed after community members successfully came together to save this historic property from demolition. This year, we are celebrating 35 years in the community. Today, we offer a wide range of programs from volunteering to educational and recreational opportunities, tours and classes. There is something for everyone to enjoy. Um, our annual plant sale, I was mentioning earlier, annual plant sale will be back this spring and we have um, thousands of plants for you to choose from. And um, we have many plans in the works for our 35th anniversary. So um, keep an eye on our website, our emails, and uh, we'll keep you posted. I'm happy to report that the conservatory is now reopened uh, to the public Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we welcome you back to visit during these cold winter months. And we just ask that you wear a face covering. So I'm going to run a poll. Um, so I stopped sharing. Um, we've got a nice crowd here. So bear with me. I'm going to put up a quiz. It's three questions. And I want you to go to your screen and fill out the poll. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to do this. Can everybody see it? You with me? I told you you would be my guinea pigs. And then I'll introduce Kent and we'll get started with the talk. So keep um, answering the questions. I need more than one of you to respond. So keep going through them. There we go. I gave you some choices there. Okay. All right, I've got about half that have voted. Keep going. If you see the um, quiz on your screen, please fill it out. I'll give you about 30 more seconds. Is it working? <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think you guys can see the, um, the responses yet though. Mm -hmm. Okay, 20 seconds. We've got about 80% participating. I'd love 100%. <laughs> How many of you are plant hoarders like me? That's what I want to know. <laughs> they just keep coming into my house. Okay, I am going to end the poll. Thank you, everybody. Um, so um, first, um, I'm going to share results because I think that's kind of fun for all of us to see. Um, again, I want to thank you for um, participating in this. Can everybody see the results here? So um, when we asked about your knowledge of house plants, um, it looks like we have a lot of people who are getting started with um, plants and um, people that fall into the category of plant hoarders, those that are collecting plants but need have still lots to learn. Um, not too many green thumbs um, on the call. And then where are we getting our house plants? I thought this was kind of curious. Um, look at that, 72% are going to independent and local garden centers. And that's a terrific place to go to get your plants. Um, and maybe Kent will speak about that later about how those plants are maybe cared for in a different way um, than maybe what they do with them at the grocery store. Um, but you can, you know, you can get plants anywhere. And then let's see what else here. Um, okay, so looks like people are very interested in watering when it comes to caring for their plants and um, when to repot. And um, 
And then maybe some pest management. So we're gonna cover all of these things in Kent's um, talk tonight. So I wanna thank you all for, um, for participating in that. It's always nice to kind of see who's in the room and get a little sense of what your um, knowledge base is. So now I'm pleased to present um, Kent Gentry. Um, Kent is the greenhouse supervisor at the Oak Park Conservatory. With over 15 years of working in horticulture, he has grown and cared for a wide, wide variety of plants. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in horticulture from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and is currently a candidate for a Master of Horticulture Award from the Royal Horticulture Society. His primary passion is connecting people with plants. And so join me in welcoming Kent Gentry to the presentation and lecture tonight. Please use the chat um, to um, insert your questions. Um, Kayla will um, consolidate them at the end and she will um, pose the questions to Kent and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, Kent, you wanna share your screen? Sure. Give me an affirmative that you can see it now. Yes. Okay. Looks great. Welcome. Thanks mm -hmm. for coming into my home and on this warm, toasty winter night where we're all thinking about beautiful green things. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and uh, listening to this presentation. I'm going to try to make it as interesting as possible. Um, I want to thank the Friends of Oak Park Conservatory for giving me this opportunity to connect people with plants uh, and the Park District of Oak Park um, for maintaining the Oak Park Conservatory, of course. Um, we're all in this very interesting creative partnership that I think we all appreciate. And part of it is to share knowledge. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about house plants. And in this first slide, I've chosen to put the word together. And when I was doing research, sometimes you see it as house space plants. Sometimes you see it as house plants. So I say house plants, <laughs> one word. Um, and I'm gonna make this lecture uh, very general. Um, I could go into the weeds and I could get very specific about things. If you've talked to me, you know that. Um, but I think the per for the purpose of this lecture, I'm gonna cover some of the basic care requirements. I'm gonna talk about pests. I'm gonna talk about uh, some disease, but not too specifically. You always have that opportunity to reach out and, and uh, have a conversation with me independently. And I, uh, uh, I celebrate that and I, uh, I hope that you do that. So we'll get started. Um, let's see if I can move my slides. There we go. Okay, I figured it out. So we're gonna, uh, generally house plants are tropicals. Um, a little anecdote, yesterday I was walking from the Mediterranean room into the tropical room and there were some visitors and I, I was kind of behind them and eavesdropping, ha ha. And they said, oh, what a wonderful room of house plants. It's so tropical. And so then I sat and I had a conversation with him a little bit about what Judy was referring to about how the conservatory started. And um, it's really a collection of the community's plants is the way I like to look at it. There's a lot of different kinds of public gardens. There's pleasure gardens, there's research gardens. Uh, at Oak Park Conservatory, we're unique because we really are a, well, being a park and we're a community conservatory. Um, so most of the house plants are tropicals. Why is that? Tropical, uh, usually tropical plants don't need a rest period. And that's anywhere between the Tropic of Cancer, the Tropic of Capricorn in that belt around the globe. Um, whereas temperate plants need a rest period. Uh, that said, um, tropical plants are still angiosperms or gymnosperms, meaning they flower or they're cone producing. Uh, they're just like every other plant. They just um, they've evolved to fit within that realm or that band of uh, climate, essentially. Um, and uh, they have so the general things they have in common are the temperature range, 
and the humidity range, and they've been selected to become houseplants um, based on that requirement in the, or based on those requirements. Um, they generally match what happens inside a home being 60 to 80 degrees uh, with the humidity levels and the fact that they are, if not evergreen, that they really don't need a rest period. Uh, so they're always, uh, you, you know, they're always at their best. Um, tonight we're gonna talk about water, light, soil, temperature, humidity, fertilizer, and containers. Um, those are all things that were in that quiz and I'm glad that one of the top answers was watering. Um, that's I think key, that's a key uh, item to, to discuss. Um, so houseplants and the research I was doing date all the way back to 2,500 years ago where, where Chinese culture was keeping potted plants. It was in Greek culture, Roman culture. Uh, Victorian is the modern era of house plants. It kind of tends to go in trends also. Um, the 20s was a, when the conservatory was started was another period when people brought house plants into the home. Uh, I think they do it because it reflects warmth. Um, I think people associate healthiness with it, which, um, and uh, also it's a certain leisure activity, if you will. Um, and as you, there's, there are studies that uh, show that um, certain house plants can absorb toxic air pollutants in the home, like benzene, and actually uh, break that down within the plant or microbes in the soil can break that down. Um, there's studies that show uh, house plants and plants in general uh, decrease cortisol levels, um, which is a huge stress inducer. Um, so some of these things that anecdotally people talk about, there is uh, data-driven research to, sh to, uh, to back that up. Um, generally, they make people happy though, I think. Um, and that's the connection with uh, people and plants. Um, so basic care, I'm gonna kind of just jump right in and we're gonna start with light. Um, I'm going to let you read along with the slide and I'll just sort of talk as I usually do. Um, so let me, let's just start off by, I want to emphasize most house plants like bright, the second word is most important, indirect light. Judy was just telling me a little bit about a plant she just bought and how she moved it around and the key to what she was telling me was indirect light. Uh, and why that is, is several reasons that you don't want the plant to work too hard um, through photosynthesis. Uh, you don't want the plant to get dry or crispy or burn. Um, most plants, if you look at it, are sort of uh, staggered in, in layers and they have varying levels of shade and light in a natural situation. Of course, trees are the predominant and then things stack underneath them. So it kind of makes sense if you think about it that way. Um, bright direct light is really only suitable for things that have evolved for that, such as cacti, succulents. It makes sense. Um, everything else, you want some variation of indirect light. In my opinion, it's the best general approach. Um, so there are also house plants like a snake plant. Uh, uh, that they can do well in low light situations. Um, some plants can even kind of go between indirect to low light situations as you move them around your house. Um, my home has all east facing windows. Um, so of course I think that's the best. I also pick plants that do well with morning light um, and that four hour period of light. So you wanna consider things like that when you um, are placing your plants, if not necessarily selecting a plant. Because um, a lot of times we select plants based on what gives us happiness and, uh, or is it pretty or aesthetic qualities. Um, but then you have the challenge of how is it, how am I gonna take care of this thing? So uh, we're gonna talk about indirect light. That means little to no direct sun contact. That doesn't mean it can't have any sun. 
Um, maybe it's only getting an hour as it goes across the windows in your house. Um, but yet that window has constant illumination. I think illumination is a better phrase for it. Now in the greenhouse, I use what photographers use to measure um, light levels. Um, you know, we, uh, I, I use a, a light meter. Um, I, you can get them on your phone, uh, download it. Um, I'm seeing little red lines on my screen. I'm not sure why that is. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you think about it that way, plants are essentially big photoreceptors. Uh, and that's why the importance of light is. Um, how A lot of homes have challenges because you can't just move your windows around. Uh, you do also have the option of artificial light. Um, artificial lights are great. Um, you, can, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a system. You already have a light fixture. You can get a CFL bulb that's meant for plants. Um, it's usually gonna be in the red or the blue spectrum uh, for different reasons. Blue is for vegetative growth, blue light, um, which most fluorescent lights are naturally blue. Um, and incandescent bulbs work just as well too. They're usually in the red wavelength um, and the red wavelength is for fruiting or flowering. Uh, and you can blend the two. And now, and like personally, what I use are LED lights at home. Uh, I grow fruits and vegetables inside my house uh, using LED lights. And you can get very specific with them. Um, uh, they have red and blue lights and you can change the configuration based on uh, what stage your plant plants at. So that's another option. Uh, but generally bright indirect light, remember that. So water, um, water does not feed the plant. Um, primarily what water is doing is acting as a transport for nutrients. Uh, it gives support to the plant, it gives turgor, what's called turgor, um, and it's structural support. Um, and if you think about it, uh, the plant is actually pulling a column of water up as it's photosynthesizing and evapotranspirating, meaning letting moisture out of the leaf. And that is actually creating a column of water that gives um, from all the way down to the littlest flowering plant, all the way up to trees, rigidity. Um, and it's moving nutrients while it does that. I included this uh, little slide. I'm gonna leave it up there as I talk, just because it's kind of a nice geeky thing to look at how plants actually work on that microscopic level. Um, and you can kind of appreciate that. So, so think of water as this connection between the roots all the way to the very top of the plant, and that might help a little bit. And of course, also, it's a temperature regulator, um, and a plant will actually open and close its leaves as it needs to regulate its own temperature. And you might see that sometime in your house or your home if you're looking closely, um, which you should be. You should love your plants that way. Um, so a lot of questions I get uh, at the conservatory is what kind of water to use. Um, studies show <laughs> rainwater is the best. Um, that's, and that's for several reasons. The neutrality, the pH of it um, works, uh, is, uh, works really well. Um, there's not a lot of added chemicals to rainwater. Uh, collecting it is a problem, especially like I live in an apartment. I can't really collect rainwater. Um, tap water is fine. Uh, there's this, I, was, I, I use the word myth. I don't mean it that way though. So, so people will say, oh, just let your tap water sit for 24 hours to settle. You don't really need to do that. Um, the amounts of chlorine or fluoride or anything else in, in tap water is not enough to harm your plants. Uh, we use city water and rainwater at the conservatory. Uh, both work perfectly fine. Um, the worst kind of water, not, and the other thing too, is if you're really wanting to baby and be special with your plants, you can go out and purchase distilled water, which can get very expensive. Distilled water is equal to rainwater. Uh, softened water is the best. So if you have a water softener system in your home, you do wanna find an alternative. Uh, and the reason, the reason for that is all the salts that they use to soften water. 
uh, is, is not good for a plant. It'll accumulate in the soil and eventually block and clog it. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about watering techniques. And this is the question I get a lot. And I think that the quiz that uh, Judy put up there sort of indicated that people really are not quite sure, uh, except for your feline friends who are sure about everything. Um, so listen to them, or in this case, listen to me. Um, and I would say when you water your plants, think about it as a very thorough, regular scheduled event. It's the sporadic thing of, oh, I'm going to drop an ice cube in my plant randomly. Or, oh, I forgot to water my house plants. I'm going to stick them in the shower and soak them. <laughs> Those things are really not great for your plant. Um, but if, so what I'm going to suggest is to get on a schedule and all plants are slightly different. And it depends also on where you put them in your home how much water they need. Um, what I will say is that second point, overwatering is really the biggest reason I kill plants, or wait, the, is the biggest reason we kill plants. Um, this includes me. Um, so it's part of trying to get to know the plant and what, the, what stage the plant is at, um, where the plant is, how much light the plant is receiving, um, which is the, part of that machinery of the plant, if you will. So overwatering, uh, you just want to love your plants, I think, is a lot of time where it comes from. Uh, two methods, the touch method, where you touch, and if the top of the soil is dry, that is likely it needs water. If you question it, put it up to the first knuckle and put that down in there. But that's about an inch, inch and a half. And if you feel dampness, or moisture or coolness, which could mean, then your plant probably still has some water and wants uh, moisture in the soil. Now, once again, this depends on the type of plant you're dealing with. Um, succulents, I find, succulents and cacti, you can let dry out completely. This might be a several or I mean, a several day period of time, um, 10 days, something like that, depending once again on the time of year, the amount of light. And it's not gonna hurt that plant. Um, in fact, it's gonna make the plant do better because it's not gonna rot the roots, which those plants have evolved to go very, very little water. Um, so yeah, the touch method is, is really good. Uh, lifting the plant up. And if it's in your home, you're gonna have more of an intimate relationship with it. So uh, you're gonna, you're gonna be used to that plant and how much it weighs when it has water and how much it has weighs when it doesn't have water. So the best way to water your plants is let is water it until water drains out the bottom. Yes, you should always have a hole in the bottom of your container. Um, there are ways to get around that, putting gravel in. Go ahead and try that and do that. But really, the best way is to have a hole in the bottom of the container so you can fill all the air or the soil, the soil um, and the the space in the soil on a microscopic level with water and let it drain out. It settles itself and then there's still air pockets left, which your plant needs. Um, so that's over watering. Um, that, it's a really tricky one. Uh, I'm gonna underline it and stress it. Um, ask me questions about it and it depends on the plants you have. Uh, underwatering is usually less of a problem your plant is going to let you know if it needs water. Um, there's going to be definitely wilt or droop, and that's different levels for different plants, but that's the indicate the key indicator for underwatering. Um, bottom watering. A lot of people are big fans of that. Not for every plant is what I would say. Certain plants do better bottom watering. And that means where the plant sits in a container and you pour water in the container instead of into the plant. Uh, African violets are a perfect example of that. So I was taught and everybody's told me that you, you water from the bottom because you, you, know, you don't want to uh, rot the African violet out or introduce diseases on the leaves by moisture. Um, I bottom water my African violets 
But if I let them dry out too much, I water them from the top to get them back up. So that's, once again, it's kind of a relative thing. Um, it's not a bad thing and it works for certain plants. Um, the, the one thing I would say would be the last point of soil versus overhead watering. Generally water the soil, just like this nice little kitty's doing. He's not watering the leaves of the plant, he's watering the soil. And the reason, the reason for that mostly is um, disease introduction, I think. Um, so we're gonna move on to soil and what a good soil is. So soil ain't dirt. Uh, soil is usually this organic and inorganic materials mixed together to give the plant uh, support. Um, it's, it's, uh, it does feed the plant, but not directly. It's holding the food of the plant that then the water can take up through this chemical exchange that says that's happening. And that's fertilizers. Uh, or, you know, that's an example. An example would be fertilizers. And it's permitting this gas exchange to and from the roots. Um, that's a little more complicated to describe, but uh, roots do need air to grow as well. And they need to breed. So, so generally soil do pay attention to and you and anything they're selling in nursery centers or big box stores or any bagged product is usually pretty good. Um, you, may ha you might have, uh, you know, one preference over another. Some mixes might do better for certain plants, i.e. cacti mixes or succulent mixes or, or orchid mixes would be another example. But generally they're a mixture of different types of organic and, in, and inorganic materials to support the plant. Um, this is a really basic uh, mix you can make at home. This is the ingredients of most pre-mixed potting mixtures. Um, peat, pour uh, with perlite, which is the white stuff, and some vermiculite. And those are mineral content and also um, they provide structure to the soil. Uh, perlite is essentially wallboard or gypsum that's been exploded. Um, mica, or, or I mean vermiculite is mica, the rock that's been heated to where it expands and puffs up like popcorn. Um, uh, vermiculite has some antibacterial qualities as well, so it's nice to put into your, your soil mixes. And they aerate the soil. The, they create uh, space in the soil, if you will. Um, so feel free to uh, this, I'm sure this PowerPoint will be available and this uh, indoor pot, potting mix is an is a inexpensive way you can do it or, or anything you buy from a, a ready-made product is still completely satisfactory as a soil for your plants. Um, the other general care is temperature. Um, this is going back to those tropical, that kind of why we pick tropical plants for our house. And if you look, it's, it's within the range of 60 to 75 to 75 degrees. Um, if home, if your house is getting any more than that, a plant can take it, but you're going to have to put more humidity uh, for the, provide more humidity for the plant so it doesn't burn, burn itself up. Um, but so the temperature of our homes really does, are very conducive to most house plants that are on the market. Uh, what I would say is the sudden drop of 10 degrees or more is not good. And where that would apply to a house plant is when people move them out too quickly in the spring or conversely moving it in into the home uh, too soon and not acclimating that plant. So like when you move it back into the house, you could maybe move it into a sheltered shady protection on your porch or something like that before you bring it right back into the house for winter. And I think the next slide kind of shows you why uh, yeah, when we're talking about humidity, so this is this is really why winters are so hard on house plants. Um, they're sort of going into this this uh, the sleep, if you will, this dormancy based on the amount of light that's available, not necessarily the plant itself, but the amount of light that's available given our latitude. So um, most homes in the in the winter are very very dry. You know, this this last number of ten to forty percent. Uh, is typical when we're using artificial heating. Um, and then let me see if I can go back to, well, no, I can't get back to the first slide very quickly to where you could see what the humidity levels 
our preference, but they're more in the 60 to 80 um, percent of, of a, a natural environment for most house plants. That's difficult within a home without doing certain things. And we'll talk about that. So ideally though, in the summer with air conditioning on that 40 to 60% range is, is perfectly fine for a house plant. Um, some things you can do to increase humidity. Um, there's the pebble tray method. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. And the reason is that's often leaving your plant sitting in a pot of water. Even if it's raised up, chances are it's still gonna be soggy in the bottom layer of your, the container of your uh, plant. And that can lead to root rot, which is a major, uh, major disease or killing a, a disease of a plant is root rot a lot of times. Um, so the pebble method isn't the best. Um, I would probably put it at the lowest level. Middle range is misting your plants. Some people will argue that doesn't really isn't very effective because you have to be like constantly misting your plants. But I put that at the middle range of effectiveness for increasing humidity because a little is better than none. And it's not, misting is not gonna create uh, uh, disease problems in the roots of your plant. Um, we're not talking about uh, a rainfall shower on your plants, putting your plants in a shower. We're talking about a misting bottle um, and a couple of times a day will not hurt. Once a week is even still effective. Uh, I do that too. And it's just sort of a, a good care routine for your plant where you walk around, you talk to your plants. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. I don't have a slide for that. You gotta talk to your plants. Um, singing to them helps too, but anyway. Um, so you miss them. You're, you're inspecting your plant when you're doing that in all seriousness. You're looking for pests. You're looking for um, you know, new buds that are coming out of your plant. You're looking for anything you might wanna prune. It's making you, you're, you're, it's, you're becoming very mindful of your plant when you're taking care of it that way. Uh, and then of course, the best method for increasing humidity is to buy a humidifier. Um, and uh, when I've had some more exotic, uh, expensive, <laughs> read expensive, uh, tropical ornamentals, I've invested in a humidifier um, to put around that and create a little micro environment for that. And that's probably the best, but it's probably also the most expensive or more expensive. So that's humidity. And, uh, and I will also say temperature and humidity are uh, work conversely together. I don't know if I said that right, conversely, they're working together. So uh, hotter temperatures, lower humidities or vice versa. Um, so you're kind of always sort of watching that interrelationship, I think is a better word between what temperature it is and what humidity you think it is. And of course you can get fancy and get a barometer and a thermometer and, and go very scientific with it that way. But a lot of it's just kind of being very mindful and knowing what's going on with your plant. So we'll talk about feeding, uh, plants, um, house plants specifically. Um, I put the, the, slot, uh, the picture on the side of it to sort of show people what to look for for nutrient deficiencies when something is wrong with your plant. So let me start this off by saying you can over fertilize your plants just like you can overwater them. And that's not necessarily great for your plant. Um, reason being you're introducing a lot more salts than maybe need, which is typical uh, inorganic fertilizers have a lot of salts in them is what makes, makes them up. It's not a bad thing, but just so you're aware, over fertilizing can be just as bad. Um, I won't go into a lot of what's in the picture because that's very specific to your plant, but this might be a good reference is what I thought for people to where they're kind of wondering what's going on. Uh, but so generally with fertilizers, I tend to go for the number three, which is the slow release houseplant fertilizer that you incorporate into the soil. And then it's one and done. You don't have to do anything else. Um, for certain specific plants that you're wanting to induce bloom, the liquid fertilizers are probably more, uh, are, are better for that. Because um, it's like an immediate injection of food uh, for that plant, nutrients for that plant. Uh, that said, when you want to 
so fertilizers are also um, creating a lot of vegetative growth, which is in the spring and summer months. So you started about eight weeks before the last spring frost. Um, definitely don't be fertilizing over the winter. Uh, there's really no need for it. It's a waste of the fertilizer. The plant's not taking it up. Um, but, but if you're wanting to grow a bigger plant, definitely start between, like eight weeks before the last spring frost, go up until you know uh, a few weeks before the end of the frost as the plant is starting to settle into its lower light routine. Um, so that's kind of the frequency. Uh, I won't be specific about one fertilizer is better than the other. I was very general about types. Um, all are readily available. Uh, liquid fertilizer, an example, would be miracle Grow. Number three would be uh, Osmocote, which would be a slow release fertilizer incorporated. Um, that's really up to your choice uh, of the type of plant that you have. So please refer back to this slide though for specific things from that picture as well. I think that's important. So containers, um, generally uh, you don't wanna repot in November when the plant is gonna be going into uh, you know, a, a, a lower mode of transpiration and activity. Um, you would want to you would want to repot in the spring when it's going to put on a sudden flush of growth. Um, generally, too, you want you don't want your plant to be uh, let's let me let me phrase this. You don't want your plant to be swallowed up by a container, so it should be about a, th a third of the size of the container, if that makes any sense. Um, the little formula on top, I think, is just sort of uh, you know indicative of people really wanting to love and take care of their plants, but it could be the worst thing for your plant. Um, I personally don't repot my plants, but maybe every 24 months. And that's perfectly acceptable. My strategy for doing that, I don't wanna be lifting a bunch of big heavy pots in and out <laughs> all over the place. And there are things you can do to, to prolong the amount of time your plant uh, needs to, to be in a pot or a bigger pot. You, you'll know that too if your pot becomes, if your plant becomes root bound, um, if your plant is more than a third or two thirds the size of the container it's in, maybe start thinking about taking it up to another container. Um, so yeah, this slide is talking about some of the things that um, would be definitely indicators of, of its time to repot your plant. And that, that, that is, if you see roots coming out the bottom hole of your plant, yeah, you do want to repot it. Um, if it's not really growing and it's not winter, um, it may be stunted because it needs more space. It needs the, uh, and if you're watering all the time and your soil's always dry or pulled away from the pot, it's, it's probably going to need a different container, more soil put in there. Um, so that's just some of the many reasons why. Um, there's also aesthetic reasons, um, but it doesn't have to be a regular occurrence. Every 12 months, you're repotting that plant. Uh, and also different plants grow at different rates, I would say that. So just sort of once again, by being mindful and being, paying attention to the plants in your home, you'll be able to recognize some of this, these things, but it definitely doesn't need to be on a schedule to put it in a new container. Um, not a bad thing to do though. I wanted to bring this up because this is one of the uh, propagation we're going to talk about, which is uh, for me, one of the fun things about having a house plant or any plant is you get more plants. Um, and it's a very easy thing to do. And, and um, uh, I learn from people all the time, they've tried something and the textbook says you can't do that. And then they do it. And um, I just think it's a great thing to do. And so when you propagate your plants, there's, there's three main ways to do it. Um, you know, the a division is when you divide, you physically divide that plant up. Like, let's say your plant in the previous slide, it's time to come out of the container. One strategy would be to lift that pot out of the container, divide it. You get two plants, put it in this, put one in the same size container, and you know, and, and another in that same, same, uh, same container that you had it, that you took it from. 
and uh, and that's that we call that division. Uh, it's very common once you take the plant out of the pot, which don't be afraid to do, other than the mess. You'll start to see the structure of that roots and how those plants grow, and it's kind of fascinating. Um, Leaf cuttings are also a very easy way to, be, to do it with succulents. It's very satisfying. We take this, this tiny little leaf and then three months later, you'll start to see a little tiny plant that's developed off of a leaf once you've set it into soil. And there's all kinds of things online. There's all kinds of ways that pe people have done that. And if you reach out to me at the conservatory, I'll talk to you about how we propagate some plants too. Um, the plants you're seeing in the picture are snake plant. And um, that's a, that's a, you know, the one in the back is, is, uh, uh, is one type and the one in the front is another type, but they're both snake plants. And those are leaf cuttings that somebody has actually just chopped the leaves up, put them in soil and the roots are gonna come because the plant has the cells. And once it gets the message to, oh, I wanna become, I want, I want roots to come here versus buds, the plant has the ability, the capability to do that. It's just sort of releasing that power or that potential in the plant. And then another one that's fairly common is where you actually take the stem of the plant. And um, well, I had one plant, uh, but it, you know, it's, it, it's a very uh, common way to do it where you'll snip up a stem that's hanging out over and uh, you can root that either through soil or uh, through water, which is this second method uh, of doing it. So this, the reason we do water is it's a little bit quicker uh, to do. Um, you can actually see the results in that second picture. You can see the roots developing. Uh, soil method is, is usually better, um, but it, it, it takes a little bit more care, if you will, to do the soil method. You have to have some, some steps down right. Uh, you have to uh, um, be more diligent on a daily basis of caring for that plant. We do both ways at the conservatory and I do the water method honestly because it's effective. It works. Um, you do have to be careful like in that second picture where you can see all the roots that have developed that on that uh, money plant. Um, that may be too many roots and the problem will become those are soft, uh, soft cell structures in those roots and then when you go to put it into soil it's going to clog those cell membranes up. So I would say usually probably half of the root mass that, that it's showing in that second picture. Um, the, roots, the, the, the roots are a little more fragile through the water method, um, but it's quicker. Soil method, it's more uh, a dependable, healthy plant. Um, it takes longer um, and uh, there's a little bit more to it. Uh, if in terms of paying attention to, to the propagation. Um, and it can dry out very quickly and then kill whatever little roots have happened. So, but be, experiment, have fun with either way. You know, every house plant you get is wanting to grow and produce offsets or, or some other method of growth. And you can exploit that and get other plants to give away to other people or enjoy yourself. So some of the common problems of house plants, I just found these little flow charts and I thought they were really effective. Um, I would encourage you all to save this somehow. I'm sure it'll be available um, to where you can answer some questions, some questions yourselves about what's going on with your plant. Um, so generally though, we'll just sort of run through the slides, wilting, drooping leaves, means underwatered plant, generally. Um, that's usually the number one reason. And put some water in there until it runs out the bottom and those leaves will slowly perk back up. It might take, it might take a day. Uh, it might take a few hours. Uh, it might be immediate too, depending on the plant you have. Some of the other reasons for a wilting plant would be, most likely would be a root bound plant. Um, that's another indicator that your plant needs to go into a new container is it's just not able to keep that water uh, for the amount of roots it has. Um, so this is another one, the crispy leaves. Why are my, why are my leaves crispy and brown? Uh, is my plant have a disease? No, it's, get, it's burning it up. It's sunburned. <laughs> Your plant is sunburned most likely. And that, that, that's usually at the tips or the edges. Um, that's where you're gonna see it mostly. Um, 
Uh, another reason for that would be instead of instead of getting too much light would be uh, not enough humidity. That's that temperature uh, humidity thing going on there. Um, so it, it's drying the plant out. It's like dried skin sort of on, on us. Uh, now, brown leaves can mean some kind of infection too. And I say some kind because I can't really be specific. It depends on the type of plant and there's and the type of virus or whatever it is. But if you move your plant away from light and you've got a source of humidity or you're misting it and you're still getting brown leaves, you're still getting them not on the on new growth, then you may have some kind of infection. If you think you have some kind of infected plant, isolate that plant. And we're gonna keep talking about that because there's not a lot you can do with infections of plants, but you do need to isolate it and you might be able to cut it off or, or um, you know, remove that virus or whatever it is from your plant, but definitely isolate it. We're all familiar with that nowadays. Um, brown spots on leaves usually is bruising. Um, you manhandled your plants too much, or you, I'm sorry, you've person handled your plants too much. Um, it's not a bad thing for your plant. You just snip that leaf off. Um, also, it could be not enough humidity, which means the the plant is um, is a little more susceptible to being person handled, if you will. Um, once again, though, with brown spots, if they're uh, it could indicate an infection and usually with spots on your leaves, which is not the edge of the, your leaf, but somewhere in the middle is that if it's asymmetrical, if it's not a, if it's not like a book ended plant, but it's, it's more of a organic shape, you might have a virus in your plant. It's extremely rare, but it is possible. Usually though it's bruising and that's just pruning your plant a little bit. Um, yellowing leaves is, is uh, generally overwatering. Um, and, uh, uh, if it's a serious problem, um, it's root rot. In other words, if you keep having yellowing leaves, you might have root rot. Um, if you have yellow leaves that are new leaves and they go yellow and then they fall off, um, that's usually, it's not getting enough light. So you want to either, either give it some supplemental lighting or move it closer to a window. Um, but if it's just sort of yellow leaves generally all over the plant or one section of the plant, that's usually overwatering. Um, so try, tr you know, try to cut back on your watering a little bit first. Um, it, it possibly could be an infection. It's less likely. And if it is an infection with yellowing leaves, it's mostly going to be just this very bizarre looking uh, like mosaic virus is one example. That, that's like, oh, it looks like a pattern on your leaf uh, that, that's yellow. And that's gonna indicate an infection or a virus or something. And once again, you isolate that plant, but generally yellowing leaves mean overwatering or not enough light. Uh, what I'll say about yellow light or in, uh, yellow leaves for yellow light, one indicator to that also is if your plant is stretching with yellow leaves, you know that's because of not enough light. Overwatering is if the plant's the same height and you usually have uh, uh, general uh, yellow leaves all over the plant, that's usually overwatering. Can be corrected. Um, once you cut your watering back, those yellow leaves are not gonna turn green. Uh, you will have to have new growth and then eventually cut off the old yellow leaves, but don't cut them off immediately. Let new growth come, uh, new green growth um, come. Uh, so mushy leaves, which goes along with yellow leaves, uh, oftentimes uh, you'll see this too in succulents a lot um, uh, or cacti. Also, the stem will get mushy. Um, that's overwatering usually. Um, with this, you might I put repotting question mark because, uh, especially with cacti and succulents, is the the potting mix, the soil mix might be holding too much water for that plant. So you might want to have a more, uh, more well-drained soil, uh, which going back to that soil slide, you can either create a mix with more perlite in it, which is for drainage, 
uh, or get a specialty mix for cacti or succulents. Um, but yeah, generally mushy leaves are mushy and yellow or mushy and brown or mushy and just mushy. Uh, and it's usually overwatered. Uh, leaf loss, stretching, usually not enough lot. And that's not one leaf that comes off. That's if you're having several leaves that, in, where you come into the room and there's leaves all around the container of your plant. Um, that's usually, it's just not getting enough light. So uh, look for little green buds, growing tips, uh, to let you know, reassure yourself the plant's still alive. Move it or give it, move it closer to the window or a different window or with supplemental light. Um, I put question mark recent repotting. Um, and this, this is true too. Whenever you move a plant, drastically, like from the garden center to your home or into a new pot, you're kind of shocking that plant a little bit. So it's not uncommon to have leaf, leaf loss. Um, that's nothing to be concerned about. Uh, or if your plant reacts a little different, like it looks, looks droopy or wilty, um, or like Judy was saying how she had a, a maranta or a prayer plant, a maranta, and she moved it and the leaves dropped down on their stems. Um, and when she told me that, I, I automatically was thinking, well, you moved it. So it was probably in a little bit like, oh, hey, whoa, wait, something's different. I'm gonna kind of go tuck in a little bit. And then it perked right back up. Some plants, it takes a day, a uh, couple of days. Um, we get it all the time at the conservatory. It's, it's, it's very common. Um, so Kent, I want to just interrupt. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking maybe this would be a great time to open it up to questions. I know that Kayla has been collecting a lot of questions. Okay. Do you um, have, um, so you've got a slide on pests. We can make these slides available to everybody. Um, I just had two more slides. Yeah. Okay. Well, why um, don't, yeah. Why don't we, um, why don't we pause and um, just um, try to get to some of these questions if that's okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. What I'll say though about pests and disease is really I only put two slides on here and it's much, it's a whole other lecture. So for pests and disease, reach out to me. Um, it's going to depend on the pest. It's going to depend on the disease. And that's something I, like I said, it'd be another hour long lecture on pests and diseases. So. Great. So um, first of all, um, thank you so much for that um, just overview of the um, house plants and it just really um, opened up my mind. There's so many things always to learn and I really appreciate it. I'm gonna turn it over to Kayla who's been gathering your questions in the chat. And so um, Kayla, are you ready to um, pepper Kent with questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's start kind of at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the best plants for just a beginner, someone that doesn't really have experience with plants, maybe doesn't, you know, know where to start? What are some, just some plants you can kind of just launch off with? This is a rubber tree plant. <laughs> this plant actually came from a cutting off a driveway for another, from another plant, um, Ficus elastica. Very easy to propagate. Um, you could see uh, when I got it, it was this big, had been run over by a truck from a driveway. And I was able to propagate it. And it's a beautiful, strong, healthy plant now. Um, very forgiving. And it, so that's if you want a large plant, because this plant can get eight foot tall. It'll take a while. Um, Actually, I'm going to say African violets for the little tiny plant, if you want to go that route. Um, they're a little bit finicky, um, but you get lots of pleasure from them. Um, uh, they they um, just need certain care that as long as you do that certain care, you're going to have a very uh, joyful little plant that's always going to give you little blooms. Um, of course, cacti and succulents are probably the easiest plant for a homeowner because they really do match the environments we have in our homes in terms of humidity as well as light. Um, so that's why they usually do the best. And you can put those right in a sunny window. Um, uh, let's see, uh, begonias are great. 
Um, there's a lot of different kinds of begonias. Um, they're very forgiving plants as a house plant and also very attractive. Um, and um, uh, pothos is a common one. Uh, we, uh, during our plant sale, we have some spiderwort or trades cancha. Uh, that's the purple, you know, filler plant. It uh, never disappoints. Um, pothos, like I mentioned earlier, you have golden pothos or satin pothos. There are different uh, scientific names for those plants, but they're readily available in a garden center. Those are vining plants. So it kind of, uh, once again, it, of course, it depends on the kind of plant you want. Do you want a large plant or a small plant? Also, ferns are very forgiving for homeowners, certain ferns, like the Boston fern. Um, the easiest one of all time is a Sansevieria or a snake plant or a mother-in-law tongue. You can put it in a bright window. Uh, you can put it in, in a shady spot. It's just a very forgiving plant. And it's the very strappy leaves, spiky. So yeah. Perfect, perfect. Um, thank you so much. Those are some really great suggestions. Um, so another question is, um, when thinking about a house plant, you know, there's the put it in a south facing window, a north facing window. What exactly are the direction of the windows and then the corresponding light that tends to go with that? How do you mean the direction? Like the So when you say a south facing window, are you is that going to be a, a full sun plant yeah. or is that going to be Yeah, exactly. So your south facing windows generally are direct bright sun or bright direct sun. Cacti succulents do very well in that. Uh, the, really the best light for also west windows at the afternoon sun that comes in so hot and bright. Um, however, in the winter time, those, uh, that's not so great because you're not getting the full arc of the sun over to the west side. Um, but in the summer, that can, you really have to use a, uh, a very highlight plant because it'll, otherwise it'll burn your plant unless you filter it with drapes or it sits below the window. Uh, best is east. It's a soft, gentle, consistent light. Uh, in the summers, you can get that for six hours a day. In the winter, you can get it three to four hours a day. Plants generally four to six hours. I should have mentioned that. But yeah, pretty much all of our tropical plants, minimum four to six hours. Um, north, not great. North just, just doesn't have the intensity of light uh, for an effective, uh, you know, effective growth of plants. Uh, that's, if you have north window, that's when you're, stuck with Sansevieria, <laughs> uh, it will live there, um, or supplemental lighting, once again. So it's getting some light and then you add more, you know, through a fixture. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so a quick question, a couple of questions about watering. Um, mm -hmm. So when, uh, as you said, the, the best type of, of water is, is rainwater. Um, does that apply to snow as well? Can you collect snow, especially no, right now? And no, it's usually too cold. However, you can collect it and then let it set and become room temperature, but you don't want to shock the roots of your plant with either water that's too hot or too cold. Another thing too is if you are watering, if your plants are outdoor in the summer and you're watering them from a hose in your yard, let that water run a little bit because a lot of times that water will be scalding hot when it first comes out and it might need to run like a minute even sometimes depending on the length of the hose but yeah water that's too cold or too hot is not great for your plants so generally room temperature water is ideal perfect and so i know you talked a little bit about you know watering the best place to water is right at that at that dirt um, yeah. And then you also mentioned sometimes, you know, you can bottom water. Are there plants, and you said there's some that don't like that. Is there any plants, common house plants, that do not like to be watered right at the root? Um, do you mean bottom water, do you mean? Yes, bottom water. Uh, generally, no. The, the ones, the, the big one is the African violet that, uh, you know, enthusiasts will say you really want to bottom, water bottom that, but then you have to have a wick that comes out the bottom of the plant pull water up into the plant. But generally, if you just get a good watering can with a spout and um, put it right at the lip of the pot, don't you love our cats? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, and, they, and, then, and then thoroughly kind of water that soil area around the plant itself. 
Um, let's and you know, for your tropicals like pothos or things like that, it doesn't hurt them to give them a quick shower, you know, and, uh, of, but uh, generally you just don't want to soak your plant with the shower, I think is the problem when it comes to that. Gotcha. And yep. so going back to the, the snow question, I know you said mm -hmm. don't, um, don't shock your plants with extreme temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, so given that we're kind of coming up on this polar vortex, if you have mm -hmm. plants that are in the windowsill, should you be taking them off? Uh, move them back uh, you because you, you put your hand up to your window and it's a lot colder there and that can winter burn your plant as well um, a lot of times with the conservatory we'll have to cut things back from the window because if they're touching that window and it's two degrees outside it's five degrees on the other side of that window pane so that's a great question actually and then even in the winter you want to move them back maybe I'm, I'm not talking like feet six inches eight inches you know, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the same thing applies then to radiators or any sort of heat source, right? Like you want to kind of cut it back as well or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the people love to put plants on the radiators because they think it's really good for the plant and actually it kind of burns up the roots zones a lot of times. Um, you want to have protection if you do that. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, here's like a maybe a bit of a specific question um that i think maybe maybe um how do you stop your cats from eating your house plants uh -huh, okay i do want to go back to the radiator thing i would also say ac blowing right on your plant is not good or forced air heat blowing right on your plant is not good if you see your plant leaf moving in the winter or summer you might want to move that over to the side okay cats I did include a link on the resource list of toxic plant list, and that's the ASPCA. And um, I use that whenever I bring a cat or a cat, a plant into the house. Um, so how do I say this without sounding, you know what, if the little, little booger wants to nibble on that plant, and I know it's not toxic because any toxic plant that I look at and find on the list, I put up to where the cat can't get it. Um, but also I'll come and I'll find little teeth marks in the plant. And that's maybe, I equate that to the cat has to learn, <laughs> right? Now, obviously if, a, if your cat or your dog, dog seems to be even more indiscriminate. Um, they will, uh, if they're wolfing a plant down, and they're vomiting or their, uh, their eyes are dilated, their pupils are dilated, um, you know you need to get that plant away from that animal. Uh, you can't get the animal away from the plant. You have to do it the other way around. Um, mostly the biggest problem too seems to be cats wanting to use your plants as litter box of a certain size. And a tip for that is to put things in the plant i.e. aluminum foil. I always have it around, <laughs> right? Um, and the cat does not like that at all. That's a really good tip actually. Um, and, uh, but as far as eating it, um, yeah, look at, look at the ASPCA list. I highly recommend that. It's been, it was recommended to me by a vet years ago. They update it frequently. And there's a lot of different plants on there. Great question. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I think we, you know, we're kind of running out of time. So maybe just one last question. So um, besides reaching out to you and Judy has put your email in the chat. So anyone that's interested can reach out to you. Um, and of course, obviously we have to make a plug for the master gardeners. Yep. Um, you can always, yep. University of Illinois, ask a gardener for questions. Mm -hmm. Are there other good websites that you recommend for just a quick kind of look up? Yeah, the, so I put one on this resource page, which is the Houseplant 411. I included that one because it's, it's, it's cross-referenced. It's very thorough. Houseplant 411, great, great resource. Uh, gardening Guru, there's a lot of them out there. Gardening Guru, um, I would say with, pardon me, if with any internet search for houseplants, get several references. Don't go to just one website. That's why I like Houseplant 411 is because it is cross-referenced. It's not just, it's not just one person saying something. 
you know, you're getting, and then you can kind of match that up and see what seems right. Um, the Master Gardeners, once again, their helpline is fantastic. Um, uh, one of my joys at the conservatory is when people ask me questions about plants and it might take me, you know, some research because I want to give a right answer. But uh, if it's a specific question about a specific plant, reach out to me at the email provided. That's what we do. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. So um, this concludes our presentation tonight. And I just want to say to Kent, um, thank you so much for taking your time to put the presentation together and to share it with everybody this evening. There's so much information. We always can learn something new from you. And so I'm so grateful that you were able to do that with us tonight. Yeah. And to Kayla, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Kayla's a new master gardener, guys. So um, she's an excellent partner in crime here. 